meeting to order at six o'clock. First on the agenda, are there any uh, changes or additions? Yes, if I could, add approved minutes of June 5th, 2019. And underneath old business, um, uh, pad, uh, ambulance purchase or you know, update ambulance. on the ambulance. Great. Community concerns. Any community concerns this evening? Hearing none, we'll go into the public hearing session of the meeting uh, to discuss uh, changes to the zoning bylaws with the planning council. Oops, I'm sorry, I did a little out of order. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> I checked it off first. Uh, sorry, back to approve the minutes. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for June 3rd, 2019? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 The motion is passed. Uh, next, approve the minutes for June 5th, which is the dog hearing. Yes. Do have a motion? motion to approve it. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is passed. Now, community concerns. Hearing none again, we'll now move on to the public hearing to discuss the uh, zoning bylaws of planning council. So turn it over to you. Yeah. Sure, I mean, uh, nothing has changed in this last select board meeting. We went through the proposed changes. Each you has a document with the yellow highlights. That's basically the warning highlighted more significant things they're in. The only thing I have since last meeting, I want to copy, Roy Marble submitted a uh, written comment letter on the proposal, which I found helpful. Some of the stuff I can't change, but it's already warned. Some of the stuff was typo type stuff or smaller stuff that actually included in the package you haven't seen in a while. I think I'll have to buy And there's some larger policy issues in there that are above my pay grade. But it's nice of Roy to go through the entire zone by a lot of stuff that looks very nice. Helpful too. And you see that the check where the check marks are is where I agreed to make the changes. Todd, um, the, the meetings that I've gone to about the, um, I can't remember the exact language of it, the housing density? The, for the affordable housing waiver? Right. Is that in here? That's still in there, yeah. Okay. So, Where um, is that? That would be right up front, section, like 205, I think, somewhere in the waiver section, 206. Check those out. Section 204.4. So 204.4G is new, creating new affordable housing for 24 BSA 4301, uh, paragraph 1 and 2, that is permanently deed restricted to waiver percentage allowed, shall match percentage of affordable housing proposed in any uh, development. Basically, development is 50% affordable, gets 50% waiver. Uh, said waiver still not exceed 75%. Okay. So basically, we're cutting, um, I'm not sure how well it will be used. I mean, you put it in the back and we'll see if anyone uses it. So if someone wants to do a project that's half affordable, they can have half, half affordable because they can have our regulations in terms of dimensional requirements, setbacks, all that fun stuff. Thanks. No problem. So that's in there. Any comments? Uh, the only comment I have is, one, is a follow-up from the same one that I made the other night about the uh, deleting the prohibition on marijuana dispensaries. I'm curious from the council where they feel that that would be beneficial to our community to open up the possibility of having a dispensary here in town. I am I'm open-minded about things. This one I'm pretty staunch on, but if the council feels strongly about that language being coming out, I'd like to know why. I don't want to speak for the board. Anyone want to tackle that one in particular? I think we looked at it, it was going to be a good point anyway. Right? Yeah, and it's really the same thing as last time. The, uh, it, is, it doesn't function as a zoning bylaw. Um, uh, at the time that was written, the legislature was looking at having town meeting vote to be a marijuana town or not a marijuana town. Mm -hmm. uh, you weren't allowed to zone for it. Obviously, that didn't end up getting through. Okay. Um, so as of right now, there's still no point to it in the bylaw. It looks good, obviously. Right. It doesn't, there's no function to it. The town, there's no such thing as recreational marijuana that's legal for right. sales. So we basically have a local bylaw that's illegal that's something that's illegal anyway. 
So if, this, if our legislature goes through and passes a law that makes it legal to sell commercial or recreational marijuana, will we have time to adjust uh, the zoning bylaws in order to address that? Yes. I mean, yeah. Ahead of time. Honestly, I don't think the council feels really strong about it to split the board on it. I don't think there's anyone worried about leaving it on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Uh, yes, there's time. It takes about two months, two and a half months to get through the zoning update process. I really don't think the legislature is going to allow the towns to zone it out because most towns will do that and the legislature wants money. Um, I'm, I'm going to disagree with oh, that. Really? Okay. Yeah, because that I think that was one of the things that they were hung up this year at the legislature uh, about local control of that, and I think that's one thing. Can you give it? I don't know. There was a big push, you know, just so everybody knows. I mean, from the, the Vermont leagues and towns' perspective, in in that policy that they advocate for us, you know, in in what the the board from the Vermont leagues, cities, and towns was trying to accomplish was to allow towns. To control that, I agree that the legislature may not be in favor of that, but I don't think that's a decided issue. Yet. I agree. Yeah, I just don't. So I don't think there's anything. There, there were a lot of towns that were concerned with, it. Um, and I think the other thing that the towns were concerned around was there was a revenue stream that obviously was coming to the state. And at the time of the legislation, there was not a, a huge, if any chunk of that revenue that was coming to the towns to deal with issues that could be created by that, such as law enforcement or all the other things that go around it. So I'm just going to disagree with you on that because I, I don't think that's settled yet and I think those were some of the hang-ups at the legislature this year um, from what I heard in the briefing that I got. On, it certainly on feels like one wicked overreach that the state would say that towns can sell it but take away the ability to zone it out if they don't want it sold. That would seem like legislature stepping on our toes immensely. Well, you know, and I think their their perspective is, you know, from there were certain members of the legislature that wanted to ensure that towns did not have the authority. It would be like any other commercial sales. You know, mm -hmm. you couldn't zone it out, which was different than the dispensaries. I mean, dispensaries, towns have given the authority in zoning regulations to say we don't want a medical dispensary here. Mm -hmm. And I think there was even just a specific number of licenses available in the state for dispensary. Right. I think all those have been used for the medical dispensary. They are all used up. In so they are all used up. But the commercial sale piece of it, you know, I, I think at the legislative level, there's still a lot of difference on how that's going to come to towns and what towns will be able to do, if anything at all. I, you know, so I, I know from the public safety perspective, I sat on that committee at VLCT. You know, that was their push because there wasn't any funding coming back to the local community mm -hmm. to deal with the issue of sales and, and the law enforcement piece of that in particular. So, my concern had been that the state, if they, uh, the dispensaries became cash cows, that they would increase the number of permits, which would open up more communities to, to apply for the things or, or the communities to have those in their, in their place. To your point, Eric, I think the I don't think anyone here from the council is expecting to pass that without it in there. I think we all knew you were going to eliminate that. I don't think anyone, I think everyone's okay with that. Okay. Thanks. And the same thing for uh, the owner office part of short term rentals. I think we're expecting that not to survive, too. So you know where I stand? We know where you stand, yes. You're on the big board. We're not the big board. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Or questions from the, from the public? We talked about this before, obviously. I mean, obviously, the planning council takes a lot of time when review on this stuff, and I really appreciate your time on all of these topics because many of them are very common sense based issues. I just, this is a personal view of mine. So. so, tell me again, say again about the owner occupied. This is the Airbnbs, right? Correct. Um, the select board last year. The planning council sees that there's a grand grandless growth opportunity there, but they also see the neighborhood compatibility issue too. When you got the same house being used for different different uh, every, different weekend, different people, different noise issues, different parking issues, it's a Friday, Saturday, it's a different parking kind of thing. So um, I think they're trending or uh, treading on the more pro neighbor side in terms of not allowing. Airbnbs to be run as a business. It's only got 17 of them in town as of right now, and basically you're kind of bypassing zoning, and there are 17 little businesses all over town in residential areas that didn't have businesses before. Um, at the same token, though, uh, the other side of the point is the Airbnbs um, 
uh, especially if it's single owner occupancy requirement, which there could be if you pass the zoning as is, bring people to town. They spend money, they go to our stores, they go to our breweries, we fill the gas tanks here. So there's two very good arguments on both sides of that. So I'm expecting you guys to not have the owner occupancy requirement. As like Chris noted, last zoning update uh, this time last year, he knows people that have built houses for strictly to Airbnb them for short term rentals. That's real groundless growth. That's four hundred thousand dollars to the groundless right there. So there's a give and take on both sides of this one. Is that in this packet? It's in here that it restricts the owner occupied. So okay. last time through one of the issues, as Eric pointed out, we kind of were tying that. It's not really a great way to tie the owner occupied. We're tying it to the lawyer checklist. If you're over here, you live here. It's owner occupied. Uh, Eric was concerned that the person who lives here six months full, well, five months minus six months minus a day because they're a Florida resident. So there's snowbirds and they pay Florida taxes and they're here five months and change. They couldn't do that. This does change that. This basically, the only way I'm going to restrict this on the owner occupancy part is making sure no one in town is operating more than one of them. So if on the little Airbnb or HomeWay map, I click on your icon, your face pops up in seven different places. If you pass this, you get a letter from me. There's no other teeth to it. Right? I, I am the teeth, I guess. And you guys are the teeth when you decide to put money towards it in court. I'm just letters. I'm really my teeth. You guys are the teeth because you guys call me court case. I have a concern about um, neighborhoods being overrun or problems with their Airbnbs when there's no owner there. It's just rental. Yeah, the, the tendency from the council's part, and you guys can jump in if you want. I know I'm taking the talking is the uh, having the neighbor, the owner component makes you more uh, accountable to your neighbors. Right. If you're there, a good chunk of the year, your renters, when you're in Florida or in the summer, wherever you are in the summer, are really ticking off the neighbors. You're going to hear about it. You're going to be out the neighbors. You still have to live amongst your neighbors. When you don't have to live amongst your neighbors, there's less accountability. Yeah. That's the theory. I agree. I disagree. <laughs> I <know. laughs> Tommy, you had a question for we'll get to you, sir. Yeah, okay, actually. Um, so, I don't know if it's the board of it or not, but uh, uh, going through, I, 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 I look back through a, a lot of revisions. This is the 13th revision to the bylaws in 10 years. And looking back through them, going back further, I noticed like sort of 2006 and, and further back that there was a lot more context to the revisions. There was actually like in Alex little paragraphs that say rationale behind them. And now it's just a almost like a laundry list of things without any context. I'm wondering why the change and where the context is and how the community is supposed to kind of understand the rationale behind these without that kind of like a handy, you know, rationale uh, narrative behind that. Do you want to get Sure. Well, last year at this time, um, we have always done the zoning updates. We've always done a track changes version. You guys see all the changes in red? And we accept them or not accept them as we go. Uh, we got complaints from regional planning last year that it was hard to understand because there's so much track changes in there that it's hard to read. So this year, there's only two ways to do it. You show the changes or you don't show the changes. This year, when the alternate, we're going to do the strike all version. So that's it. So that's why you're seeing a new, here's a new proposal of strike all. Last year's bylaws is this year's bylaws. The, the context was last year, and that was a, uh, an issue, apparently. So. I chose the other route through the woods this time. Can't win either way, I guess. You had a comment in the survey? Yeah. Um, I, I sort of, I, I, my experience with Airbnbs, they're not really a high risk endeavor with respect to you know uh, zoning. I find that they, they don't bring a high risk demographic. And I find actually they bring people who are you know a middle class to professional class. With lots of disposable income, and they, they don't they don't bring a demographic change to the downside. In addition, I also find that because people pay more money for short-term periods, uh, you, don't, you you have much of a less of a risk of someone who's undesirable to be destructive and a bad neighbor being there for six months. You tend to have someone there for you know a shorter period of time, and then you know you have, you'll have you'll have several people. I just think in terms of zoning, it, it's really a low-risk endeavor. And something you may not you know, want to take away from a private owner uh, too quickly. Thank you. Thanks. Well, just to clarify that point, if I could, we're not taking away the ability to do it from, from any individual who lives here and is the owner of their property. We're taking
taking, we're preventing the collection of housing. Uh, that was the goal, was to prevent the collection of multiple houses owned by a single individual who doesn't live in any of them or doesn't even live in the state. Again, to the point uh, that Todd was making about accountability to, you know, to your neighbors, because this isn't a, it's, it's kind of an exploding market. And we are concerned about getting out of hand. Um, I looked at you last time talking about the, the metric in this area of the number of Airbnb properties available. It's just it's kind of astonishing, I thought. It was yeah. So I actually went home and looked at that. And it was significantly lower for any given weekend than you identified in the meeting last time. Furthermore, the actual number of viable properties um, was really limited. Um, so Did when you like a more than a two-day rental kind of thing? I, did, I picked on random weekends throughout like throughout the summer. You got to do at least three days. A lot of people don't rent for just two days, so you'll get much more icons popping up when you do a three-day time period. Yep. Okay. Um, the other thing is a lot, there's a lot of things that are on there. You know, renting. They're uh, they're not private spaces, so uh, Airbnb can utilize anything from your porch <laughs> your room, yeah. to you know tenting in the backyard. I mean, so those are not two distinct options that I think the neighbors would have issue with, and that's part of it, the the the, uh, the crux of the problem that we're trying to get to. So. Uh, that I, I that I understand, but I think so. One of the arguments you made was that there's there's a an immense amount of options, but there's really not a lot of viable options for um, for good lodging in this area. And I would agree with the gentleman in the back um, that we utilize Airbnb. We have tons of friends that do that come here from out of state and quite frankly spend a lot of money when they come. Um, and I think not having a lot of viable uh, lodging in this area is a challenge. Yeah, we've lost all the B&Bs and Inns in the last few years. Thistledown is gone, the Maple House Inn has been vacant since August, and um, the Village Victorian is gone. We don't have any Inns downtown like we used to. Part of that is they've lost their market because everyone's doing it. So Airbnb. So yeah. B&Bs can be on Airbnb. You're correct, correct, yes. And now part because of that, because those kind of old style housing isn't there for visitors. And now the actually the other side of the point is the Airbnbs and home homeways and are more important because there's nowhere else to stay now other than the sunset. It's always there. Different different market though. If I may, I mean it's important to um, compare this to the other primary issue that the planning council has been addressing this year and that is the issue of housing affordability and housing density. So some of the other changes on the list are trying to make it so that developers can put in more housing densities, particularly in the village setting. So we have this, these two problems is we're trying, on the one hand, housing is being utilized for vacationers, for, for people coming in from away, and that's bringing revenue and that's, that's very good. But on the other hand, we have, um, kind of this, I won't call it a crisis, but a borderline uh, significant issue with housing affordability in this region right now that we're also trying to address. So it's hard for those two not to be discussed even in the same meeting. And I will leave it at that. Uh, but giving it, giving the, the limited stock of housing that we have in this town to vacationers does take some bit away from people who are trying to live here permanently. And you know, companies like MSI, part of their expansion plans were contingent upon their a very real need to have housing for their workers in Morrisville so they wouldn't have to truck them in, bus them in from from uh, from the, the Burlington region as they do now. I can understand and respect that. Um, I, again, I, I think I, I would agree with you. If we uh, if we are not economically diverse, then we are probably going to need more affordable housing. My point is that we need, you know, tourism income is pretty important. It's people who are spending a lot of money. 
I'm just concerned. My vote or my opinion back a year ago was that this go through some sort of DRB process. That's instead of totally closing the door to it. I think that is a big mis misstep. And that's I, I will not waver on that. So. I don't. I don't hear the board, the planning commission, um, totally closing the door on that. It does. Chris, you cannot Chris. build a home if this passes. You cannot build something or rent something unless it's owner occupied. So it doesn't it doesn't close the door totally. But okay. Have you rented it for before? Uh, no, but we're in the process of maybe having one in our own home. Okay, and there's different stock of Airbnb, so there's just different types of properties out there. Steve? What, what do you think of a DRB process for that, for Airbnb So Todd had mentioned before, so say I want to build another home on my property. It's not owner-occupied, um, but let's see the, I, not, I don't know the in details, and Todd may be able to, to step in on this was that in order to get the permit granted, it would go through a DRB process that would open up the doors to the neighbors to have opinion on, on that project. So that was, that was what was discussed before. There are multiple houses on Stagecoach Road alone that have been built to support Airbnb. Those projects wouldn't have happened under this. So that's my point. I like. I, I don't. Also, don't disagree with. I don't. I wouldn't want you know next door neighbors all the time, you know, partying, especially in a downtown sort of area. Uh, I get it, but I am concerned about limiting the the stock of lodging and limiting Grand List growth. So, those are where I come from. I think this is. Um, I think we can be more creative than this. Any other comments? Tony? I think this goes back to context a little bit as well. Um, so I understand what Tom said about the, the, the difference between showing the rationale behind the, the, the changes and whatnot. But it seems that going back, there's been a lot of um, changes to the bylaws, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, that are based upon whims, perhaps, of public individuals or businesses and whatnot. I'm thinking like there was a uh, Farms trying to build a, uh, I think a gas station, a platform gas station up at the old man's building. Uh, it, it fell through and the bylaws were changed to outlaw gas stations in that area. And now Skip Valley owns these and nobody, you know, presumably <laughs> would build a gas station there anyway. There was the, 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 the marijuana dispensaries where the last round of uh, bylaws, there was a prohibition. Now this one lifts it. I don't know if that's because of changing the laws or prevailing popular opinion regarding cannabis. Uh, I remember there was a uh, talk about uh, the three doctors that were leaving Chesla who wanted to start a new family practice, and there was a suggestion by the board to actually update the bylaws to allow hospitals or a, a healthcare facility in that particular area that's not allowed. I'm just wondering if there's a concern that this like is borderline spot zoning and it, it is done on a uh, on, on, on a basis, uh, you know popular opinion and who talks about this or who has the most money. I'd like to address at least a portion of it, anyone else can jump in at the time, and specifically to the doctors uh, that wanted to set up over on uh, Industrial Parkway. Um, I can understand where that would look like, oh geez, we've got an opportunity here, let's change our zoning to allow this. What we looked at more importantly was the fact that in that same region, we have an eye doctor, we have a dental practice, and we have a, a mental health care practice which fell under a generalized description of other uses. So it was our choice since we already in the past had allowed such medical uses in that area that it was time for us to get more specific with the language, make a change that recognized the, that, that piece of it. The marijuana dispensary, I can tell you honestly, I, I accept the explanation that, uh, that was given tonight in that dispensaries, all the permits are given out in the state. It seemed like it was unnecessary legislation. In fact, Todd used the same language to me when I proposed it the first time we put it in there. My fear again, as I stated, was that the state would decide, oh, we got a cash cow here, let's issue some more permits. So taking that out under the idea that they haven't done that, it's a useless bylaw. They're, they're constantly revising this uh, in order to make it a more streamlined document. 
Um, you can compare our zoning bylaws to area communities bylaws and notice a significant difference in the length of the documents and subsequently the confusion within those lengthy documents that makes it hard for developers and uh, makes our community uh, much more attractive for responsible growth. Um, those are two of the three that you mentioned. I'd forgotten what the first one was. But the gas I, station. The gas station. I wasn't around for that one. I'm not sure yeah. where that came from, but the other two I have been on the board to address. But did I, I mean, that was my opinion. That's how I've viewed what's gone on. I don't yeah, well said. And the, the marijuana thing, you, you had us put in maybe four years ago now. Yeah. I think they tried to take it out last year, and this year it's on the table again, which mm -hmm. is probably not going to go forward, but it's part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's been there for quite a while now. I think the hospital, the, the doctor's moving. There was also some past history that the hospital uh, organization asked for zoning to be up at the hospital, and they were consulted with this move, so it was all above board, and it, there was consulting going around to who, all the players that were involved. So I, I don't remember the specifics on the gas station. I think that started at the planning council level. Um, I think the council decided they don't need any more gas stations. Yeah. So um, but I think the other thing, too, I think from my perspective, you know, being through the zoning changes that we've been through for the last 12 years, is I think we've tried to stay nimble. Um, you know, you know it's, a, it's always a changing thing. Um, I think marijuana is probably a great example of how things change maybe at the, the legislative level that we've stayed nimble on and, and not waited to become a crisis and try to stay ahead of those things. So I think, um, I, I think Todd and I both have recognized that we're, we're not going to pretend that our, our bylaws are perfect. And if somebody can come to us with a mistake that we've made, then I think we're, uh, we're responsible for bringing it to both the Planning Council and the Select Board to recommend those changes. Um, and, and that's what we've done, I think, in the time that Todd and I worked together, that we're not going to pretend that they're perfect bylaws. And if we see a mistake, we're going to admit it's a mistake and move forward with fixing it. We're pretty darn good, though. <laughs> Sir. Thank you. And I just wanted to say one more thing about the Airbnb. I think one of the problems with zoning about it is, is it confuses the distinction between private property, uh, residential and uh, commercial property. So it's a confusing thing for a zoning, uh, a zoning rule. But you also have to remember the, uh, the right, the private property right to sublet. So I just hope, you know, when you, when you people, you know, draft a rule or a legislation, you know, narrowly tailored so that uh, you remember the constitutional right uh, people to use their private property. But you also, I understand some of the problems that people are facing. There is a confusion between what's commercial, what's residential, and but you also have the private right to sublease. Sub so, there, I'm done. Anything else? One more, just. <laughs> uh, I did notice today got a, a, a special uh, select board agenda for uh, for Wednesday. Uh, the, the special select board agenda is uh, to approve these these uh, bylaw revisions, if I'm not mistaken. But that's the same day that the village trustees are warned about a month ago to have a whole public hearing on these exact bylaw revisions. So I'm wondering how that. Select board feels they can approve the bylaws an hour before the trustees even hold their their public meeting about it. They're different legislative bodies. And we'll have to talk to the trustees. I'll talk to the select board. We'll have the same discussions. Normally, the, the trustees uh, pretty much move in lockstep with the select board. I understand that the board really reports to you. I mean, the planning council is appointed by both boards, but the uh, the buck really stops here. And, so. and uh, if for whatever reason that both boards didn't approve the changes, then they both have, I guess, like a veto power. So it's not unusual that we don't do that, or somebody would be, it's pretty hard to keep everybody with different meeting schedules and warnings and everything that goes on for both legislative bodies moving on the same time frame. So that's nothing unusual. Part of the force, yeah. Very good. Cool. Close up, Steve, you good? I'm good. Very good. So close up the public hearing.
Moving on the normal agenda. What time will we be Wednesday night? Five. Is it once long? Five o'clock? Here. Five o'clock? Yeah, we'll do the road thing after that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. Too bad. So, five o'clock this Wednesday. Thank you. Yes, five o'clock here, then the road here is after. Okay. I may have to give you, we have to make the check. It ran over my phone and my lawnmower this weekend. Huh. So, I'm a little out of here. I wasn't there, I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm a little, uh, yeah, unplugged at the moment. Um, next on the agenda, is there any liquor control? Good. Old business. Update on the ambulance? Hi, good evening. Uh, so, uh, as requested, uh, I made a site visit down to Rockland last week to look at that truck that's available down there. Um, there uh, I submitted a report to Dan, and I'm assuming that went forward to you guys. Um, so that truck uh, is a 2013 Type 1 uh, ambulance uh, with a box that's pretty consistent with the previous ambulances that we've had here in um, it, uh, it does have, it does have 128,000 miles on it. The box and the cab itself uh, has been just physically refurbed top to bottom. Uh, and there's pictures in your uh, report of the interior of the ambulance. Uh, and a repeat of the uh, exterior pictures that we had previously. Um, that uh, vehicle has been serviced every 3,000 miles by Alderman Chevrolet in Rutland. Uh, I'm familiar with the truck, I'm familiar with the service program there. Uh, and uh, I could not find anything uh, that would make me not trust that truck to our people uh, on a primary or a secondary call here in Wellstown. Uh, so uh, that's the details on that truck. Um, uh, Micah Haven, who's done the refurb on that truck, uh, he has not submitted to me yet a written estimate to paint it to match our current A1, uh, but his verbal estimate to me uh, when I was down there was somewhere in the five dollars $5,500 range. Uh, but he would be unable to do the graphics. Uh, as part of your packet, there is also an uh, estimate in there uh, from a uh, graphics company uh, in the Newport area who also has a shop in St. Jay, uh, who has uh, previous experience in vinyl wrapping ambulances. Uh, so he would vinyl wrap uh, the, uh, this proposed ambulance to match our current truck, and that would include all the graphics uh, for just under 7,000. Uh, so, uh, so that's another consideration that we have to explore. Um, I included in page two there a proposed budget for this for this project, uh, which included uh, the price of the ambulance, the uh, graphics package, and uh, some funds to uh, uh, remove, reinstall radios and the uh, uh, narcotics med vault that we have to have uh, to secure our controlled substances on the ambulance. Uh, bringing uh, the total allocation that we would need for this particular truck to uh, 45.5. Um, we do have some. Uh, we do have an allocation in the upcoming budget, um, half of uh, a 42, 000, total 42,000 appropriation that would have put a striker power load system in the uh, current A1. Uh, that uh, I'm hesitant to do, obviously, because of the condition of that truck. Uh, so uh, Dan and I and Corey met the other day to talk about funding, and Dan can probably. Dan can certainly talk more intelligently about that than I can. Actually, I'm going to have Tina talk intelligently about okay. that. So, about the, the, the funding piece of it. But I'll just a little bit. The, the 42, you know, the, the, the 21, 20, 100,000. Right. right. Yeah, admittedly, half of that would be carried over to the following budget year. So, essentially, really we're looking that. at funds that don't exist in the budget that hasn't right. been developed. Yeah, exactly. So, that, that was kind of a capital plan. It's not a budget. That money doesn't exist because that budget is it wrote or approved or anything like that. But I had Tina just go through some stuff today so, or to, to explain. Yeah, in the upcoming budget, it. we have 21100 available that you could potentially use towards this if you chose not to get the power load caught that Bill's talking about. But that still gives you a budget shortfall of $24,400 that you don't have anywhere in your budget uh, for this coming year. The only thing that you could do is you do have the um, budget surplus from last year that there are funds available there, but that's really the only place that there is any budget money 
or any money at all that's, to. Yeah, that's not really from last year. That's the cumulative. That's a cumulative. You know, once again, the auditors recommend that we're some we should have. You know, I, I like ten percent. Well, the uh, discretionary right. funds you're talking about. Exactly. Yes. Well, the un what, what's the right term? The um. Unallocated. Unallocated. Reserve yeah, unallocated reserve. So I think right now we have about. Right um, now you have four hundred and ten thousand four hundred dollars in unallocated reserves. Right. And I think the auditor's recommendation would be that we we have somewhere around the six hundred thousand dollar mark. Right. Right. So I mean it's been working up. Sometimes it goes backwards. It's just based on budget years, but it, you know it's not where we would want it to be. Yet. The. Um, is there a regulatory? What, what about the striker system for the new ambulance? Uh, the uh, it came with the with the new ambulance. It's a striker power lift system. There's a there is a requirement from the state of Vermont that new ambulances sold within the state have to have this power lift system or a similar system. So let me back up. Sorry for this. If we were to purchase this old ambulance, yes. What about uh, the striker system for uh, that? It, it, because it's an, ex it, it's an ambulance that already exists in the state of Vermont, there is not the statutory, excuse me, the EMS rules requirement that it have a striker power load system. We could go with the current yoke system that's currently in A1 uh, until we purchase a new ambulance. That new ambulance down the road would have to have the power load system. Understood. I will say my concern with that, my personal concern with that is though we heard a fair amount of testimony that we really needed to do this for a host of reasons. So that makes me a little nervous to say something comes up, now we don't need it. Okay. Can we, just my arguably, can we, if we put in the, the uh, new old ambulance, <laughs> That's what scooped me up. So, <laughs> if we were to order the striker lift system for this new old ambulance, yes, when we are looking to purchase a new ambulance, would that striker system work in the new ambulance to save us the cost, save the taxpayers the cost at that time? We should be able to transfer from one to the other. They could be retrofitted into an, into an ambulance, so I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be able to move out of an ambulance into a new ambulance. But that, that, that we, we would have to have strikers come on site to do that. So if you, if you do that, then you know, we're committed to, because we were going to lease that for a two year period, so it was at least a um, was what we told them to budget. So then if you do that and you install in your new old ambulance, then the total purchase price of this ambulance would have to come out on funded reserves. Right. Well, what's the um, like the this the system, the striker power, and then the um, whatever the, whatever you have now that you're going to transfer? What's the pro and con of that? Uh, well, the striker power load system is completely uh, it's 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 a back saver essentially. Um, with the with the current yoke system that's in A1 and that's in the proposed ambulance. Um, is it you, like a Hoyer you bring you bring the stretcher to the back of the ambulance. The weight is lifted is on the front wheels of the cot and you simply hold it, power the, power the carriage up and slide the ambulance in. The power load system does all of that. You essentially lock it into the yoke, push one button and the ambulance, uh, the stretcher lifts itself. And, uh, and you know, like I said, the EMS rules now want new ambulances sold in the state of Vermont to have Striker Power Load is one system of several that are out there that do essentially the same thing. They want one of those systems installed in all new ambulances in the state of Vermont. So Dan and Tina, the new old ambulance go with the current Striker system. You're saying we, how much money are we short for a two-year lease purchase? Right now, you have, in, in this current, the upcoming budget for 1920, there is budgeted in that budget $21,100. If you do not buy the striker cot, you can use that towards the purchase of an ambulance. If you use that, then you're still gonna have to, uh, to if you wanna put a striker into it, then you, you've still gotta come up with a... No, I'm, well, I'm, I'm past that now. Okay. Uh, the important thing is we have that backup ambulance, to me. So we have 21 in this year's budget that we can So you need to come up with 24.4, is what you need to come up with that we don't have anywhere. We could always 
strike the striker out for this year and just put it in next year, though. Correct. You're good. Good. You're good. The other thing that, that in, in fairness to the conversation that we had, just so everybody, you know, trying to get on a, what I call a good capital budget yes. schedule, which is important to us. So, you know, budget-wise, um, when we're doing the budget, you know, the one thing that we have the most flexibility in is to the capital budget. You know, your fixed cost budget time are your fixed costs. So, you know, we've worked hard with finance to kind of keep the capital budget to thing. I mean, the, the, the realization here is this, we just went through our first year's payments on the new ambulance. We have four more years of, of payments. To make this work, to get us out of trouble, I would be reluctant to recommend anything that we weren't, that we did not think was gonna last us that four year cycle. Because if we do, then we're spending money and the idea is to get that at four years so that we can start a new loan payment for a new ambulance. Mm -hmm. and I think everybody's in agreement on that. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to short sight ourselves and you know, only have something that's gonna last, and you know, you've said two years in the report we've talked about since, but four years to me would be the goal from a financial perspective so that once we're then finished paying off the current A2, the, the brand new one, then we're ready to go in with a new purchase and, and keep our capital budget as level as we can. I, you know, that, those peaks are what drives this crazy come budget cycle. How much is a striker system? Um, the power lift system is currently 42,000. 42,000. Yeah. The reason why we're trying to do that every two years. It's, yeah, it's, it's almost split 50 50, about 20,000 for the stretcher and 20,000 for the system itself. Uh, yeah, they're, they're not cheap. Oh. So, if I'm reading this in here, though, you said you would expect this to last two years? Well, that's what we had talked about at one point in one of our previous discussions on this, was looking at something to get us through a two-year cycle so we could plan more appropriately uh, for a town meeting uh, for a replacement uh, for a new ambulance. Um, I could easily see this, this truck being a three or four-year truck. Uh, you know, yes, the mileage is high. Uh, it's 128,000. It's been on a uh, it's been on a pretty vigorous uh, maintenance schedule for its life in Rotland, and I don't see any reason why we couldn't continue that here uh, now that we have leadership in place that would uh, that would move that ball forward. I'm not as concerned about the high mileage since the ambulance we don't do on a regular basis runs to UVM Med Center. Right. We aren't doing the long distance hauls. That, that happens, but very infrequently. Um, and there would be an opportunity, I think, to swap the ambulances out to go to the manure rig Agreed. to do that transfer anyway, if need be. So, um, yeah, the only the only thing I would do because if you got a Cadillac ambulance and you got a Volkswagen ambulance, no offense to Volkswagen, but the Cadillac gets run a lot more. I just would hope. Right. Yeah. Like, well, we, an ambulance that doesn't move rocks. Right. Leadership's plan would be to. Uh, if, uh, if we went with this proposed truck, we would we would throw it in rotation. Perfect. We would we would start going back and forth whether it's uh, what and we can design that how whether we do it monthly, bi-weekly. Um, we do it by level of certification. Yeah. One, make one truck the paramedic truck and one truck the non-paramedic truck, and and divide the work that way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, certainly certainly I'd be comfortable putting this truck in a rotation with the current, with our new truck. Yep. Yeah. I, it, it, with that, with you having that in mind, I trust to, yeah. that you'll take care of that piece of things. Yeah. That's my concern. So the concern is, where's the money come from? So we're looking at, yeah, twenty five, twenty four thousand five hundred ish. Yeah. I, I explained that we had a good conversation about yes. you know my vision of the budget and you know and things that come up. And, um, is there any current construction money? in the uh, ambulance building budget that those construction projects could be delayed? Not really, I don't think so. No. There, there's nothing, you know, like, you mean like carpeting or something like that? No, there's really nothing that they're doing. I think they've done the stall it. Yeah, we, we just, I can just look through it. But I looked through earlier to see if there was anything that we could push off and I didn't see anything. Yeah, you know, we have some select board designated funds, but I, I don't know that I want to change those around. I mean, those are important things to do town-wide as well. Um, are you recommending it comes from the... It's really the only place that we really have to take it from. I mean, you know, and I explained to Bill that, you know, we struggled hard to try to, to get that to where the auditors recommended. And 
to a certain degree, things come up, and, and we all understand that. Um, but it, it does financially, it's just a little bit of a setback for us to to reach that goal of the 10%. But you know, you know it is, it, is this is an emergency, you know, kind of thing. You know, it, it does impact our ability to provide EMS service you know, to the community. So I would say this, in anticipation of what's going to happen to our administrators that are out here tonight, next September, October, when we get our wish list based on any funds that might be left over from the current budget, make your list short. <laughs> I would see that as, yeah, I know, I know, the, the money is spent responsibly, I'm just saying that we may not have that money, we may need to replenish those, these funds. But to me, this is a crisis. We, we have to have that second annual, as far as I'm concerned. Given no other al alternatives, I think the bill has explored all options, including borrowing ambulances, which... Right. You know, I think, you know, yeah, I, I don't think we're coming, we're coming to you with yeah. a, a frivolous thing here. No, no, say. not at all. Um, you know, but, uh, you know we're, we've been pretty fiscally, I think, responsible over there. So, um, yeah, this is just, this is a truck, the current truck is just, yep. I don't trust it for my people. I, I, I'm just, you know, broadly, you know, thinking wider than just Morristown, Morrisville, and now more of the communities that, that we serve. Wider, I think it brings back to the discussion, too, of, you know, um, emergency service and public safety in particular. When you're, there's resources out there in the county, I think, that get underutilized. And I think, you know, it, it goes back to the District 4 to figure out, you know, there's, there's often ambulances that are sitting there not being utilized. And we're adding another piece of hardware out there that I think broader, and it's not something that I think that could even be solved at the select one level, but I think the state level needs to look at how do we address that. Um, it's, it's a shrinking pool of volunteers. Um, you know, you've got a state mandate now that says if you're going to buy an ambulance, you've got to spend an additional $42,000 on it, you know, to for the power. All that's good stuff, but, you know, uh, unfortunately for communities, that host their own ambulance service, a lot of that falls back on a property tax that is already stretched thin. And, and I, my concern, once again, is that broader kind of aspect of you know, how we provide those public services to the community. But, you know, the chief thinks about it all the time. You know, it's, it's, but EMS in particular is stretched really, really thin statewide. And I think you know, we're going to have to figure out ways to force the legislature to get more creative on how the those, those resources to provide that to a community are utilized. I have it's my soapbox. I have drank gallons of coffee over conversations about regionalized ambulances and fire services, have we not? <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it is definitely we're, we're, we're putting in, we're kicking a can out of the road, I, we can't afford I, to kick I, I would out. concur with, with what Dan just said and also put in that uh, uh, that our current ambulance billing and revenue is ahead of where we we project we would be. And a lot of that is due to Tina's fine work in getting that billing done. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, our revenue is actually ahead. Uh, we're projected in the $190,000 range as, re as revenue coming into the town uh, for the current year. Any further discussion? The is there a, where's the exact dollar amount? I'll make the motion. I just, uh, well, is there an exact dollar amount? You, and not to exceed. Not to exceed 25? And not until next fiscal year. Sorry, Bill. No, that's fine. We've got, what, this, this, is, this is important, but it's not a crisis because I do have a truck that's okay. usable until the end of August, so okay. we're ahead of the curve here. All right. I make a motion that we approve the expenditure of $25,000. It's going to have to be the whole package. Okay, well, let's, we'll give me a dollar amount. 40, $42,050. $45,500. Oh, sorry, yep. So then I am. Sorry, $45,000. I make a motion that we approve the expenditure of no more than $45,500 purchase to be made after the 1st of July, 2019, for the purchase of the 2013 ambulance that was identified in all the documents here. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is passed. Thank you. Well, thank you for thank all you. the work you've done. I think. Yep. Thank yes. you. Thank Tina you. as well. Thanks. Uh, moving on to new business. Review solar proposal for the ER salvage yard. This is used lotto. This is the, the, the 45 day notice. You know, it comes out to the various boards. Um, and any comments or observations that the select board may have. It seems like great repurposing the property. I'm my, my, board has talked about yet, but okay. my oh. assessment is that planner is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> it's really got limited visibility from the road. If you look at yeah. the entry of the site plan, yes. I mean, part of the zoning change where if you look at the new zoning map right behind Dan's red shoulder, that dip where the yellow goes down, that was basically there to include the junkyard, include like Peter Bourne's vacant three family, those unutilized properties that the different river hundreds. And this just checks out on the city house and that's right, right, right off. It's great. And, and the solar being all surface type thing, there, if there's a, has it been identified as a brownfield site or not? The state, <laughs> I don't believe it has. The state has fined them for um, fluids on the property. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's some controlling contamination but it's, there. All right, so they're not having to contend with that piece of it then? And not, not to my knowledge. Okay. They're not really moving much soil in the solar beam. Please, yeah, so. please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great use for the plant property. I'm, I'm all for this. I'm just, I just. I, I agree. Up. As the board knows, I've been somewhat vocal on how I'm a proponent of solar. I like seeing it used in repurposed land like this. This is great. <clears throat> Has uh, Morsel Bar and Lake expressed any sort of um, a plan? Uh, this is much more solar that's coming up. These, these questions of these potential sites are coming up more frequently and are much larger uh, than I, I personally realized at this juncture. And I'm just curious if if somebody's talked about a plan, like we want to put in X number of megawatts by such and such a date, or there's like a physical limit whereby we can't export more than why megawatts? So that would be a Todd, you probably have more knowledge of those discussions. They're on. aware of this. Yeah. They're supportive. Yeah. I can tell you that like any project, yeah. it's right up on the end translation line. There's a little line loss. Um, they are concerned as the more and more solar you get, it's expensive electricity to buy. So they're concerned that it impacts rate payers in the future as you get more and more of it. I can't speak to the, for the trustees to see if they have any grand plan or how many megawatts. I mean, you can't really stop it. It's coming in. They're now looking at the smaller utilities. For a long time, the town shielded from it because the developers were looking at the power sites and the larger utility companies. Now uh, they're on to the more medium sized <coughs> companies, and that's why we're seeing it. So I don't know if you're going to find I do know specifically for this project, not being myopic, but they do like this project. Sorry, I can't answer the bigger part of your question. I'm not sure I know. Well, I guess more so what I'd like to. They, they should. Yeah. I think that would be nice. It, it just said in the, um, the uh, description that the electricity generated by the project will flow to Morseville Water and Light electric grid for the benefit of VPPSA and its members, including Morseville Water and Light. Yeah. So it sounded as if there was some conversation there, making yeah, it they're, 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 they're home 113th of it, whatever it is. I think Morseville Water and Light owns what, 113th of EPSA? <laughs> That's it is the conglomerate of the small municipal utilities. So Waterline is actually an owner of this project. Minority, but uh, the same thing with the uh, solar panels with Trump Hill. That's was me a Waterline project. and once of a tractor supply. They basically sold the project to Bepsa to minimize the risk to while still getting the benefits of partial. Any other comments? Okay, well, no comments, I'll pass that on. Very good. Next on the agenda is approved changes to the zoning fees. The, um, you have the fees in your package. Uh, the really only thing we're changing is the legislature required that the uh, town clerk increase the reporting fees of July 1st. 
a lot of those zoning fees are kind of reporting baked in. So when the legislature says change the reporting fees, my fee needs an update too, and really that's all you're seeing there. So for example, right now, pre-July 1st, if you want to do a site plan review, you have some hundred bucks total. And my, basically the zoning department all goes in the same pot of money anyway. The zoning takes 50, the town clerk takes 50. But now instead of $10 a page, it's $15 a page. So if I don't want to take my fees, the town clerk's going to lose money on recording. Or I want to be. Someone's going to be lose money. So all they are doing is to uh, update it to reflect basically the higher recording fees. And there's certain couple fees on there that were 40 bucks, because basically they're like, which is a pretty good deal. You're going to put a new driveway, go with the other, go with the roll, and look at the driveway, look at the site distance, we assess the culvert, I come back, issue the permit. And there's a decent amount of staff time goes into that. It costs you 40 bucks for us to do it in $10 recording. Now the permit fee is not $10 anymore, I just rounded it up to 50 bucks flat, which is still a deal. And it's $15 recording on top of that. So that went from 50 to 65 total. It's just the one page, just those. That's it. Okay. I make a motion that we approve the uh, subdivision fees increase effective 1 July 2019. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. This was not budgeted, so look at my budget in the fall. <laughs> and a year from now, because I think I will print <laughs> You're going to be a hero as a result of this? The, the legislature, probably, because they actually raised it a lot more than I was aware. Yeah. It's at least 50% on the revenue report. Yeah. yeah. I just got an email that said pass along these fees. Wow. They'll pay for the notes. That's a lot of permits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of recording fees. Mm -hmm. A lot of recording fees. It's everything, of course. One permits, though, too. All right, next on the agenda is Point Town Health Officer. So, if you, the Todd is the current one. I am the health officer. I'm, I think it's part of my contract. I have to be the health officer, so feel free to reappoint me if you'd like. I read a, a, a document in here from the state recommending that we do a three year term. Is that what we're doing tonight? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My term, this is this is the last three-year term expiring. Actually, and you're recommending that the state is like now is actually an agent of the state and the health officer. Even though the state has no financial resources. No. Do, that's Say it's not so. Yes. <laughs> All right. I make a motion that we appoint Todd Thomas as our health officer for a period of three years. Second. Term starting one July. Is that what we're doing? Or is it's just eight one. Yeah, I think it's eight one on there. Eight one. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is passed. Sorry. Condolences. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next on the agenda is approved itinerant vendor license. Um, this business has been coming, I think, to the town now for three, four years. Yep. Um, you know, we've never had any problems with them. I think it brings people to the town to see the oil rail trail and bring a few tourist dollars in. So we've had absolutely no issues or no complaints with them or problems that I've ever heard of. This the bike, Dr. Mike, I actually saw a bunch in town this weekend. A boat. Mm -hmm. If you go to the right time, they're all there. They were, they came up and were, uh, we were at, on Lower Main, I think, lunch. Saw a bunch of them. So. Are they only there on Thursdays? There are different spots in the Loyal County. Yeah, yeah they do different days. free range tours. Oh. Like this one day, they do Johnson, they're over there. They do the tea room in Johnson. They do the, the brewery one here is the main water school tour. Because I read it the same way. So there's a line that says Thursdays, Thursday. June through October. Is that? I think that's what they've always done. It's never been you know, a full week. It's one okay. day a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Make a motion we approve the license for Lamar Live Bike Tours LLC. Session. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. Next on the agenda is add member to the EMS roster. Bill? Uh, Frank Holliber is a uh, newly certified EMT. He's a graduate of UVM's EMT program. 
Uh, he's done all of his uh, uh, clinical and observation time with us here in Morristown. Uh, he's a Morristown resident, uh, and uh, we like him, he likes us, and we'd like to bring him on as well. <coughs> Very good. Make a motion that we add Frank Holliver to the EMS roster. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. Thank you. Uh, staying with you, uh, Bill, we have a approved full-time member for e hire for EMS. Okay. Uh, so Diana Osborne is on a uh, approved leave of absence, uh, effective this week through August 17th. Um, and uh, we've uh, identified uh, an advanced EMT uh, who's available uh, to come on as a temporary full-time to cover those hours to uh, try to uh, try to attack our river time uh, and uh, bring her in as a full-time member for uh, Diana's leave of absence. Uh, it's Melinda Smith. She's a uh, nationally registered Vermont licensed advanced EMT. Uh, uh, currently, uh, currently employed at Copley. She'll be leaving that to take this position. Um, uh, she uh, lives up in the EMS District 2 area up in uh, Troy, Newport area. And this is the temporary full-time position, no benefits, at 1650 an hour, I think, is where we settled. Uh, yes, sir. I make a motion that we appoint Melinda Smith into the temporary full-time position at a rate of $16.50 per hour to begin, give me a date. Immediately. Immediately. And end? If, if you could please just after your motion, no benefits. No benefits. End August 17th. Say again. End on August 17th. Sure. Yeah. That's what it says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I just didn't want us to get in a position where Diana asked for another week and then we got a, a hole. But we can address that at that time. Yeah, actually, the personnel policy has already been addressed okay. on how that would work. So. Okay. Thank second. You. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah, let's have it. Motion is passed. Thank you. Thank her. That's really great. <laughs> Don't make promises you can't keep. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, next is appoint a member to the DRB. Um, John Bloss resigned from the DRB after the last hearing. Well, two hearings ago, I had a hearing last week. And um, I have a couple alternates on the board. Uh, Mary Ann Wilson's expressed interest in taking the full-time seat. She's one of the existing alternates. The trustees uh, appointed her as the alternate last week. In order for the alternate, in order for, sorry, the trustees appointed her as a full-time member last week. In order for the appointment to take effect, both boards have to agree. We have to have that synergy. So if you if you vote Mary Ann, she's the full she's going to replace a full-time member. If you don't, then I'm still looking for full-time member. The trustee vote doesn't matter. I make a motion that we appoint Mary Ann Wilson the full-time member of the DOD. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion has passed. Please Make thank sure Marianne. Is that just to fill the rest of his term? Yeah, we can fill the rest of his term. Okay. <clears throat> if you need to make that part of my motion, you can do yes. that. <laughs> Next on the agenda is to approve fireworks permit for Richard White. Chief, you've looked at this? I've seen it, yeah. It's up on Darwin Road on the 4th of July. It's a little old. It's like all small type fireworks. I think it's nice that you ask permission. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> 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 yeah. We usually ask for 30 days in advance just so we can get things posted. So he's a little bit outside of that. But. And any uh, domestic animal possible issues in that area? <laughs> Anybody's sheep being herded and no, driven not down? Up that one. Oh. No, not up that one. Okay. You left that happen. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we catch the brunt of it the next yeah. meeting. <laughs> now, I think I'm going to approve Richard White's uh, application for fiber permit for the 4th of July. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion is passed. 
What's on the agenda is approved pavement cut for Wilkins Street. Is, uh, the applicants are um, putting an apartment onto their under the garage. That's it's in there in the barn. Right, and then they need to uh, be able to connect it to water and sewer. Uh, the village foreman has been out to look at it, and they've agreed the cost for our student the asphalt patch. They know that and they've agreed to pay that that cost to us. Local contractors doing it. We don't see any issues with it at all. Compacting the soils. So we do it. We're not. Yeah. <coughs> So, like I said, you know, the, the guy that they have with their contractors doing it, who's always done great work for us, so we're not worried about that. And we put together the estimate um, for them before we have fall back. So they need to divide the barn off, and they won't be able to do that with a separate utility cut. So it needs a, the village requires a separate utility lines in if they're going to create a separate parcel, which is probably in the future plans. Okay. Make a motion to approve Janessa Van Dyke's application for pavement cut on Wilton Street. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion is passed. <coughs> Next. Vermont peanut butter equipment again. Mr. Sherman, I um, found some other stuff, you know, with the, the stuff that we have in Vermont peanut butter that he would like to purchase off the town. Um, I think, once again, I think it would be a, a fair offer on the equipment. And this would be used to pay towards the legal fees. So he's offering two hundred fifty dollars for the item. Yes. Very good. Did the last transaction go through? Yep. I make a motion that we approve the sale of these items for two hundred fifty dollars to Mr. Sherman. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. Dollar by dollar. <laughs> Next, prove the sale of the police cruiser. This is our oldest uh, vehicle. Uh, a year ago, we took it out of the, off the first line on the market with the intention of having our So we did use it off and on. It didn't get used a lot, actually. And then the, during the winter, it wasn't going to pass inspections. So we put the storage. But I just went up last week to get it down in the garage, took it over to Valley Chevrolet, and asked them what they would give us for it. So $3,000. So they have spare offer to do the condition of the vehicle. And idling hours too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have a real rock problem with that car. It's just not that great shape. Make motion we approve the sale of the 2013 Chevy Impala for three thousand dollars to Lamar Valley Chevrolet. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Do they take off all the print on the car? It's all right. Everything's been taken out. Everything's been taken out. So, yeah, it's nothing. It's just a hearsay. Anything else? Thank you. When we do this, I believe I know the answer to this, but we're not under any obligation to get multiple. Very good. No. All right. I have a motion and a second. Uh, no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Lost Remember which one we're on? <laughs> yeah, I know which one we're on. Jeez. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Opposed? Motion is passed. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Approved tax anticipation notice. So I sent out four bids to four different banks. I only got three bids back. Um, one of the Banks only gives a line on credit, so it's there's only a cost um, to it. So there's really only two banks that came back with a rate that we will make interest from it. Um, my recommendation is to stay with a union bank, um, as the interest is a lot greater and it would have been great to work with their current system. We use. I make a motion that we use Union Bank for the borrowing of anticipation, anticipated funds taxes, correct? 
Second. Can you see the amount in there? Yeah. Uh, the uh, profit is, uh, oh, well, you want the Just total. The loan amount. Loan yes. amount, $2,070,308. $70,308. Thank you. The motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. So there'll be paperwork you guys will need to stop in and You'll let each more in the next meeting. Once yeah, they'll draw it up. And okay. The last meeting is Wednesday. Are you talking about? Oh, uh, no. Sorry. The next regular meeting? Okay. Regular meeting. Okay. All right. And the last thing on the regular agenda here is approve uh, private road naming of Sparrow Lane, <laughs> Caleb Sedevi. I believe that's been through the process and he has to pick a name for the road. Correct. Um, sure. right. So, um, 312 for Delmore, this is right by um, the Cody's Quonset Hut. So there's that little driveway back up there and Caleb bought uh, some land from his in-laws and he's going to build a house and this is the fourth house on the street road should be done last time. Uh, and I once said you must name a road, so they came up with Sparrow Lane, which is a good road name. I once said it's fine. It's a good name, I think. Very good. Uh, make a motion that we approve the naming of the road of Sparrow Lane for private, private roads. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. Good. Next, approve warrants. Make a motion to approve the warrants. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. Bob helped you make this agenda up, didn't he? Snickering the whole time. Knowing he wasn't going to be here. No, you can wait. You can wait. You don't have to do that. <laughs> All right. TA report. So, Dan? a few things. Um, the long awaited class one paving project has begun officially 15 minutes ago or so. So, um, so they've been great to work with so far. The contractors stayed in good contact just so you kind of a a brief overview of the schedule. Um, this week, they'll be primarily grinding uh, the downtown area. And, and getting that, we've asked people not to park their cars in the street. PD is going to assist them in getting cars moved. Um, we, we're working real hard so that we don't have to tell anything and letting people know. But it's here, and they're going to be doing that. Their, their real hope is next week, depending on weather, is to put a leveling course across some of that so that it's not really as rough. Once again, that will be weather dependent. Once again, a lot of that work will be done at night. Um, traffic will flow, it will be slow, and it will be noisy in the downtown for the next couple weeks. There's just absolutely no way around it, um, but I think we've, we've done our best to minimize it um, and, and keep moving on. After we get past this next phase, what you're gonna see is probably for the month of July, they're gonna be adjusting all the structures, manhole covers, Water shutoffs, catch basins, sidewalks, replaced in guardrail, all the signs get replaced um, with the hope that it'll be ready for um, paving um, again right around the 1st of August. Once again, a lot of that's weather dependent. So um, they're going to keep us kind of updated on that weekly schedule. Trisha has been going and visiting the businesses um, to make sure that they understand what the impact will be in the businesses. And so we, we did have some restaurants that. You know, there, it's not going to be a fun evening to go out for a meal if you have a grinding machine sitting right out in front of you, you know, tonight, tomorrow night. But they understand it's got to be done. So we, we're going to do our best to continue to communicate with them and let them know what's going on. But it has begun. It's, it's a long, long overdue. Um, fourth of July is coming up. Um, Chief and I talked today. Um, just a quick reminder to people, want to be handy to put it in the newspaper, too, that parking will not be allowed during the parade on Bridge Street. Portland Street and Upper Main, you know, or Main towards the, the memorial. Um, and we're going to bring people in to come off starting early in the morning. Once again, getting that public word out will help us eliminate a lot of problems. So it's going to be a big change to do that. Um, Fourth of July is coming up. Parade, once again, starts at 11, just like every year. Now we've got music and fireworks, I think, starting at 6 o'clock down on the Oscar or something like that. So um, and, and the fireworks, so everything after that is down at the Oxbow. So those things I don't think have changed from previous years. So uh, the, um, just a lot more work. Well, there will be a lot of adjustment getting people not parking on the, the main through here. 
through that period. But, a, but afterwards, they can, like for the fireworks, people can park Yes, there. We'll, yeah. we'll remove the cones and the blocking is specifically just for the parade. Right. Good yeah. idea. Good. So, um, We've had a couple of discussions. I've had you know one resident approach me a couple of times, and this is this kind of get a feel for um, what the select board's opinions are on for Jake break signs, or please don't use Jake break signs in the what I'll call the Class One highways in, in the downtown. Um, it's not enforceable. You know, there's no way that we can go out and stop. But I, you know, I'm reluctant to put up these signs, you know, if there's not some sort of concurrence from the select board. Once again, then I think we put the PD in a situation where we're putting up signs, it's advisory, we can't enforce them. So, you know, I, I don't know what the board's feeling about Jake's breaks and those signs that say, please don't use your Jake breaks. Or, you know, I, I just want to be responsive to people that have called me and asked about them. So we have that bigger problem with, when I think of that, I'm thinking about Tandem axle dump trucks, log trucks that are hauling, but are they really using the village as a thoroughfare? I don't buy, you know, the truck traffic has dropped off significantly since the opening of the bypass. I don't think we have nearly the truck traffic that we used to. The jig brakes start at my house about 5.30 in the morning. Most of the trucks are speeding, they get to the best street and they turn their jig brake on. And there's one outfit on Randolph Road, Paris Brothers, that does it all day. Yeah, the speed too. There's no reason to use a jake if you're going 25 miles an hour. More like going 40. The other, the other place in town I get is the bottom of Brooklyn Street. The right there. Well, that's understandable. Yeah. I want them to have as much breaking opportunity at that intersection as they're going to go right into somebody's house. Um, they all do it down by my house, too. So yeah. that, that's where I was thinking. Yeah. In the village. I'd also like to point out that Stowe has those no jake break signs. And, you know, I drive into Stowe a lot. I see trucks, they're not using the jet brakes. They're the same trucks that they're driving through here. So a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Uh, and I, the jig brake noise is excessively loud. I would say comparing Stowe and Marshall is different because of our little delay of our land on a couple of these streets, the Brooklyn Street. I don't think Stowe has anything of that incline or decline uh, mm -hmm. um, that they deal with. but. I mean, it, it's not enforceable. It's a courtesy request for signage. We could put it at the village limits locations on those class one roads. I, I, I don't see any harm in adding a couple more signs, I suppose. I, I mean, seriously, if they'll comply with it, that's great. I just, it's got to be clear that it's not enforceable. Right. That's the biggest thing I think that the chief and I have talked about. Is it a noise issue? I mean, is, uh, Manchester has one, Burlington has one. Nobody enforces these things? Noise, noise ordinances by state statute start at 10 p.m. and end at uh, 6 a.m. So it, it wouldn't fall under a state statute. Uh, I, we have an ordinance that mirrors the state statute for noise, noise in the nighttime. Daytime use, there is no statute for, for noise levels. And they're really, again, unenforceable unless we have uh, the meters to measure the level of the decibels coming out of the trucks, and it's, I'm not even aware of anybody that does that. Is that why it's not enforceable? Because we don't have the meters? I, I just know that I don't know anybody in any law enforcement community in this state that has the, the decibel meter to read. No, I mean, if we did, we'd be going after exhaust systems on cars. <laughs> uh, but is that, is that why it's not enforceable? I, I, I'm not aware that there's any law about daytime noise other than there is a decibel rating for inspection purposes on motor vehicles. As far as it being a, a law in motor vehicle law, which I don't, I don't think there's a motor vehicle law that says it has to be a certain decibel rating. A certain decibel, that's loud. Yeah, it is extremely loud. And, I don't have any issue with science. Okay. Yeah. Over signs. I won't be able to put them up until after the class. This project is finished because they're going to change out of those signs. But yep. we'll order them and have them ready, and I'll get with the chief on where he would like them at. Do you need a motion for this? No, I just you know it's just kind of it's come to me a couple times. Um, the chief of I've talked about it. You know, I've talked to the board about it a couple times, and you know, previous boards have said no. But I just wanted to come back and yep. say, you know, what's the, the board's opinion? It, it varies. And I don't know it's here. 
Good so where, do you, where do you live? Over on Jersey. I live at 406 Jersey House. Okay. Right across from Best Street. Okay. Right when you stop to go down the end. Yep, yep, that nice big house right there. Yeah. And the nice hedges. <laughs> and the granite. <laughs> Those are there to keep the noise down. Yeah, understood. Understood. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I and, and we have other means too. We have the speed cart. You know, the chief is very open to putting the speed cart out to try and make people aware of it. I know it. I'm reminded when I see the solar panel signs that are mm -hmm. out there too, and I, I let off the gas immediately. So it's, uh, maybe we can uh, to look at the, doing something like that, which would decrease the need for the jake brake, as you pointed out, slower speeds. So. And finally, perhaps most important, Abigail had a seven pound, 10 ounce <laughs> little girl. Nice. Over the weekend, so um, me to May, I believe. Myla May. Myla May. I can't read my own right. So Myla May. So um, other than that, I mean, it's been busy around here. Lots of stuff going on. She has been she has started to close out last year's budget, make sure stuff can be done. But other than that, um, that's what we're working on. Big thing is uh, the, the paving project. And it's it's, it's going to cause a lot of disturbance in the area. I don't hear any noise right now. <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah. I'm working one end of it tonight. So. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions for Dan? No. Good. Select board concerns. Judy? I'd just like to thank Bill for all the work you did on the ambulance. It, I mean, it's quite a packet of information, and I appreciate the professionalism. Thank you. Uh, two pieces. I, in, in light of the, the paving project that's going on, which is going to be hugely beneficial to our downtown, uh, I really appreciate the level of communication I've seen coming out of here in the front porch forum, the social media sites. I've seen a ton of it. Everywhere I go, I see it, and I'm really liking it. The fact that Trish has gone business to business and talked to those folks about impacts and days of the week. Uh, she and I talked at length uh, down at uh, Wednesday Night Live about that very thing. I just appreciate all the efforts put out by the town staff to, to make sure that word's out there. And that leads me into Wednesday Night Live. I went this week, it was fantastic. Trish organized the weather to come off the perfect. She has some amazing powers, but uh, easily over 200 people down there on that Oxbow, and the vendors were doing a great job, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, stuff being sold, a variety of foods. If you want to be from there hungry, it's because you didn't bring any money. <laughs> but it's awesome. I have plenty of money, believe me. <laughs> As somebody who now lives just about half a year out of state, okay, and go back and forth to Alabama close to a year, I, I too appreciate your addressing the streets, because Vermont right now, without a doubt, has the worst roads in the east, the whole east coast, overall. So you're 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 surpassing the state level of roads, so, okay, by doing this. I just I just appreciate that. I, I can't take credit for this. Was actually a state project. Yeah. So, so you no, know, but whatever. I but I okay. but I've always did give us a five hundred thousand dollar bond two years ago. Yeah. And with that, we added the additional budgeting money. We put out over a million dollars worth of pavement in the last three years yeah. here along with this state project and the state's doing Route 15 through Morrisville as well this year, we're going to be really uh, in great it's shape. It's not going to be this year. That's going to be, they're doing wool cut line out. So that won't be, that project's out still two years with Route 15. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll back. save my car yeah. wheels for them, but right, anyway, we're still going to be in very good shape. Brian? Yes. Who dug on Main Street? The speed bump in. Yeah, um, that was unexpected. He came in and apologized to me for not getting the permit to do it. But he is working with me so that I can get everything done before they pave, which is a pretty tight time frame. So. Is that the he, yes. Okay. So he's putting his, his water and sewer in. Um, I figured that's what it was, it's getting lighter. in before they black time. Right, so we're, we're getting them in so that. And the other thing is, too, is since that's concrete there, you know, we put the, the matching depth of paving included in concrete, so there's you know, six, seven inches of asphalt that we've got to go back in there, and I want to get it done before they put that shim coat on next week. So we're, we're trying to find the timeline on that one, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing, is Cochrane Road done? Yes. The top coat's done? Yes. So is there something wrong with the black top nowadays? I see. Yeah. I, I'm not a road person, but mm -hmm. I drive that every day. And There's great big patches it in it. Look and I'm thinking if you've got a brand new pot, pot top. I know you, you, went, you, went, you went finished, but I thought there was going to be another coat and I wasn't sure. And then I see these patches there and I'm thinking, are they selling us junk? They left big holes when they did it. It was the most 
just yeah. random thing. It was like there were random squares. I'll tell you another place. There's another place up here as you come down on Copley Hospital, turn on to Maple Street. Looks like the water has washed a hole right there in the road on the blacktop. And I'm thinking, I've never known a water to wash blacktop. But. I'll take a look at that one. I didn't, yeah. Roland seemed to be happy with the Conkin Road because I was kind of, he said they did a great job for me. No. Well, I just see, you go down through and you can see where they patched it. And I'm thinking, why are you patching? A brand new road. I know there was some problems, but Roland said they came back and fixed it, so I'll find out. Yeah. So, but he was, you know, when I talked to him, he was just wondered. content with it. So, um, I'll, yep. I'll look up on Washington. You say Washington Highway in Maple? Yes. As you come off in the, the, on the uh, turn there to come on to, and you can see where the water has kind of ate the road away there. Right there. I'm so thinking that's brand new. undercut it, or there could be a little sinkhole. Is that yeah. on Washington or is it on Maple? It's on Maple. That's all I got. And I am good. Man, any other business? I have a couple things. I have a BCA meeting next Monday. I only have five people right now. I need uh, a lot more, so spread the word. When is it? Monday? Monday, 6 o'clock. Oh, um, well, I'll be there. Okay. I guess I didn't tell you, but. Usually, but usually in the past I have said don't come, uh, don't tell me. I would assume you're going to come. I changed it this time because it's we're starting to get into oh, summer, summer, and I know people are away, and so I, I, I changed what how I usually said. I actually, come? I think it's at six here. She, you emailed just the other day, or someone did. Yeah, yeah, just a few days ago. Yeah. I'm going to send them a follow up because I think I only have five people right now that have said. I can come. So I'll need to figure out if I need to schedule it because we need more to have it. Um, the other thing is the, in case you hear the Vermont, um, a lot of changes in um, the legislature. So vital records laws changed July 1st. And there's a big process that's going to be involved getting your birth or death certificate in the state of Vermont. Um, you can go anywhere to get them. But um, you have to fill out a lot of forms and you have to prove identity and stuff, so. So if you need a copy, go before July 1st? Yeah, that's my un unofficial, <laughs> that's my friendly word of advice. Just if, in case you hear rumblings on the street, this is not something I made up, it's um, statewide. Effective when? July 1st. This year? Yes. This so it could be a lot of increase. We don't know revenue because a lot of people work here. You know, we're a hospital town. You can come here to get, if you're born in Burlington or wherever, you'll be able to come here and get birth so, That's going to be So what I probably should do is hurry down and get get mine early. Not the, 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 not the death strip. Right on, just leave it blank. Just, <laughs> the just, just get a blank one. It's just the process. <laughs> right. <laughs> I that, can get a blank one, right? That piece of granite that your birth certificate was chipped <laughs> into. Yeah. <laughs> well, I figure I get a blank one, I throw it in. Yeah. Get, get it where you can, right? So talking about birth certificate. Yeah. No, I was thinking no, the other one. He was thinking the other He said get one earlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, one, one last quick thing. Tomorrow, uh, Tuesday night, next week, is the uh, fourth annual opioid summit. Next week or tomorrow? Or Daniel, what? Opioid Summit. Let me get it right. Congressman well chosen yes. around next, table today, too. Next week, Tuesday, at the uh, Green Mountain Technology Center, starting 6 o'clock, is the Opioid Summit. It's the fourth annual. Uh, I believe the Tatro family is going to make a presentation there. They lost their daughter to an opioid overdose several months ago. And they are also the driving force behind the, uh, the uh, treatment center in Johnson, the former Catholic Church. Um, I would encourage everybody to, to attend that summit. And a lot of information comes out about our community, about addiction, about treatment, and it can help to uh, alleviate some of the fears around that being in my backyard type of thing. Please don't get 5 o'clock. We start here. Wednesday. Wednesday, 5 o'clock. Just a reminder for your July 1st meeting, uh, State EMS Chief Dan Batesy will be here uh, with a uh, Vermont EMS Star Life Award for Corey. 
Yeah. Uh, and if we could do that at the top of the meeting uh, for Dan's convenience. What so meeting is that? July 1st. July 1st. July 1st, select board. Uh, so uh, you may, may have seen the, the piece that Scott Fleischman did over the weekend yep. for Channel 3. Yep. That's nice. And we're, okay. still going, we're still moving forward with some other things on that. Okay. Great. Anything else? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. You make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. I'll motion a second. All those in favor say aye. All right. Aye. aye. aye.